Welcome to the Crossing Church. Can you keep that applause going as we welcome our South Stroke campus joining us live, our Plant City campus joining us live. Come on, keep it going, and let's welcome everyone watching online and around the world. We're so glad you joined us today. We're so glad you're here. Wow, what an awesome crowd here at the Tampa campus as well. Well, as always, it's an honor to speak on this platform, and I want to thank our, our lead pastors, Pastor Greg, Pastor Tamara, for leading this church and for this opportunity. Can you show them how much you appreciate them? We love you. And actually, Pastor Greg is here actually at the Tampa campus for the service. Isn't it nice to know we have a pastor who likes to come to church, right? That's amazing. It's so good. So this week, we also begin our church-wide 21-day fast. Who's excited for our 21-day fast? And, you know, even if you're not excited about, like, giving up food and stuff, you can be excited that God is going to speak. He's going to speak to you individually and to your family, and we believe to this church corporately. And so Pastor Greg has a video talking about the fast, and we have an entire page with resources, beginner, intermediate, advanced level fast, whatever, wherever you can jump in. You can go to wearecrossing.com slash fast for all that info. And we want to encourage you, ask God what you should fast this year. Don't just assume he wants you to fast Brussels sprouts and broccoli. <laughs> Actually ask him and then do what he says, amen. So we're beginning a new series this month called Into the Trenches. So over the last few months, we talked about Nehemiah and the gates rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We learned about the seven mountains of influence and culture. I believe now we need to actually start putting that knowledge into action. As we enter this 21-day fast and a new year, that we actually take that and start moving with the power of God and affecting the world around us that we begin to engage with culture, but while we actually stand firmly on a biblically-based worldview. And I want to open with an example from the Apostle Paul, where I believe he illustrated this so well throughout his ministry. If you didn't know the Apostle Paul, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul went from persecuting Christians to having a radical experience on the road to Damascus to becoming a Christian, seeing the risen Christ, and then having an incredible ministry where he spread the gospel throughout Asia Minor. And so if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17, and if you have your iPhone or tablet or whatever, you can use the Bible app. You can't really turn in an app, but you can swipe real fast. Go to Acts, chapter 17. And this account is the Apostle Paul speaking to the city of Athens. And I want to show you a picture of actually where he spoke. This is Mars Hill in the city of Athens. It's there today. If you visit it, you can go up and stand on it. And this is where Paul actually spoke his message to the Athenian community. And if you look at this rock from a different perspective, you can actually see that the Parthenon is in the background. You can go to that next picture. And you, this is Mars Hill right here at the bottom of the photo. There you have the Parthenon and the Acropolis. And all that was built 500 years before the Apostle Paul got there. So as we read this, I want you to imagine the Apostle Paul speaking to the Athenian community, but in the background are these massive monuments, idols, and statues to pagan gods, all sitting there in the background as Paul is preaching the gospel. And we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 17, starting with verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him, and he saw that the city was full of idols. Again, the Parthenon, all the statues, all the false gods. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God in the marketplace every day, those who happened to be there. And then also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, you think of the Greek philosophers of the day, argued with Paul. Some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? That's like a Shakespearean insult if you didn't get that. They're making fun of Paul there. Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus. That's Mars Hill. That's translated as that rock we just saw in the picture. And said, may we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of. For what you say sounds strange to us. And we want to know what these ideas mean. And we jump down to verse 22. It says, then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus, he stood on that rock at Mars Hill and said, Men of Athens, I see that you're extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. 
Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. What a bold statement, as behind Paul is the Parthenon, statues of Greek gods all over, and he says, God does not live there in shrines made by hands. In a final passage, jump down to verse 30, it says this. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He's talking about Jesus. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So if you're taking notes, the title for today's message is this. We are in a battle for the mind. We are in a battle for the mind. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray you use me now, speak through me, speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll return to Paul's address in Mars Hill in a moment. But first, I want to describe a little bit of trench warfare. The series is into the trenches, and so I looked up what was trench warfare like. Trench warfare reached its height during World War I. This is the early 1900s. And soldiers would spend an extended period of time in the trenches. Here's some pictures of soldiers from World War I. Many times the trenches would fill with water. It would be really bad conditions. There would be sickness and illness. You can go to that next picture. Men had to sleep in the trenches. These were the sleeping arrangements. That would be like a one star on Yelp if that was like today. But it was really bad conditions. It was not fun doing the trench warfare. But as I read about it, I thought this was interesting. This comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, trench warfare is resorted to when the superior firepower of the defense compels the opposing forces to, quote, dig in so extensively as to, watch this, sacrifice their mobility in order to gain protection. Trench warfare wasn't ideal. In fact, it was to sacrifice mobility to gain protection. I believe for many in the church today, even many longtime Christians, we have sacrificed the mobility of the gospel for protection out of fear. We have sacrificed going out into the marketplace, into the world, and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness for fear of what we will encounter, and we have dug in. And we have succumbed to fear and self-preservation and protection, and we're now in the trench just sitting there out of fear. We refuse to leave. One of the scariest moments in trench warfare was called going over the top. This meant it was time to push against the opposing forces, taking great risk in order to gain ground. You see this picture. The men are about to go over the top, leave the protection of the trench, and engage with the enemy forces. And they say trench warfare was a game of inches. You would not gain feet or yards. It would be a game of inches. You would just move forward an inch as you push against the opposing forces. I believe that's a picture of what we as Christians need to begin to do today. I believe we've had to do it, but we've not. And it's time to go over the top, press in, celebrate just a gain of inches. Now, there's a segment of Christianity, I would say especially you see this in the progressive Christian circles, that the idea of war or fighting is contrary to the gospel. That Christianity is all supposed to be about love, peace, and maybe chicken grease. <laughs> and while, yes, Christianity at its core is about love, there actually is a struggle to be happening as well. And I believe there's a vast misunderstanding of what the enemy is, and that is why people say we shouldn't be fighting. And so I have three questions for you today that will turn into three points. Number one, what are we fighting against? What are we fighting against? If we are indeed in a struggle, in a war, in the trenches, who is the enemy? What are we fighting against? And I believe the first misinterpretation is that we are fighting people. That as we stand for morality, as we stand on biblical truths, that somehow we are actually against the very people we're trying to save. And it is this twisting of culture that makes it so either you have to agree or you hate. Has anyone know what I'm talking about? 
If you disagree with someone, if you try to offer an opposing viewpoint, even in love and peace, that you immediately means you hate someone because you disagree. I often use this example. If you had a close friend or family member struggling with drugs, overdosing regularly, what is the more loving thing to do? To help them stop on that course, to help them stop along that path, or to allow them do what they want to do and what feels good and eventually leading to destruction? What is the more loving thing to do? It is actually to disagree with their actions in order to love the person. It is a distinction that we need to be able to make as Christians, that we can disagree in love, that disagreement does not equal hatred. And I want to remind us that we are not fighting people. We are not against people. The Bible makes this crystal clear. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, world powers of this darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. It really does sound like we're preparing for a battle, doesn't it? It's talking about armor and resisting and taking a stand, but it's not against people. We are fighting against bad ideas and false teachings. That is what we are fighting against. Spend any amount of time watching TV shows or movies, and if you don't think carefully, you are bombarded with these ideas, and you have to filter them. You have to know when something is contrary to the gospel, so then you can, as the Bible says, stand firm. You can't stand firm unless you know what you are standing on. You need to stand on Scripture. You need to know the Word so that you can see and stand against what comes at you. Watch this. Romans 16, verse 17 also encourages us. Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause dissensions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have learned. Bad ideas and bad doctrine, that's what we're fighting against. Avoid them, for such people do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. So many bad ideas and bad doctrines out there. We need to stand against it. Another encouragement, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I've heard it described that we as Christians need to have hard centers with soft edges. That means that our beliefs and our doctrine and our biblically-based worldview needs to be rock-hard and steadfast. It cannot move. But as we spread the gospel and engage with those in culture, that we can love and describe these things in peace. In his book, Every Square Inch, Dr. Bruce, Bruce Ashford makes this distinction. We have three choices in Christianity. We can be a Christianity against culture, Christianity of culture, or Christianity in and for culture. Number one is problematic. We can't be Christianity against culture because what is culture? Is culture some faceless, nameless thing hiding under the bed? No, that's Chuck Norris. He's under the bed. <laughs> no, culture is not some faceless thing that we're fighting against. What is culture but the people? Culture is the people espousing ideas. And so we can't be against people we are trying to communicate the truth to them. And so we can't be against culture. And number two, we can't be a Christianity of culture. That's a compromising Christianity. That's compromising the moral laws in the Bible to look like culture. That's an easier Christianity, but it is a false Christianity. We cannot be a Christianity of culture that's compromising. No, it is the third option. We must be in and for culture. We need to be able to move and engage and speak with those in the world and be for it because God wants us to reform culture. What is the Lord's Prayer but not let your kingdom come, let your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. It is not a dismissal of culture, a dismissal of, well, everything's going to hell and so we just need to get rid of it. No, God calls us to reform the culture. That's why we teach on the seven mountains. 
And it is a battle of inches, as trench warfare is. And too long, so many inches have been gained by worldly ideas and culture because we have not stood to withstand it. And so it's time to get over the top, out of the trench, and start gaining inch by inch back for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Romans 12, 2, again, makes this clear. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You see, he's not saying to dismiss or destroy or be against it. It says be transformed. The call is to transform culture. So number one, what are we fighting against? Bad ideas and bad doctrine. It is a battle for the mind. Number two, what are our weapons? If this is truly a battle and we have an enemy of bad ideas and bad doctrine, then what are the weapons that we are equipped to go into battle? Three weapons, love and empathy, knowledge and discernment, and thirdly, the Holy Spirit. And let me go deeper into each one. Number one, love and empathy. It is the first thing that we should appeal to when we spread the gospel, when we deal with those who are not believers yet. I love in the Mars Hill Address that Paul, talking to the Athenian community, who spent a year and a half in Athens with the Athenians. I want to tell you it takes time. It takes an investment of time with the people around you, your coworkers, your friends, your family. It takes time investing the gospel into people. It is a battle of inches, not overnight. But watch what he says in Acts 17, 27. Paul is saying he did this. So they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find God, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. And I love that line, he is not far from each of us. Paul is saying, listen, you are seeking something, Athenian community. I know you have these false gods. You're looking for the supernatural. But let me tell you, the true God, Yahweh, is here, close to you. He is not far from each of us. And just as in Paul's day, people today are hurting. People are hurting because of physical ailments, financial struggle. Maybe they've lost a loved one. Families are being broken. People are hurting. And this is what the gospel is for, for hurting people. The love of Christ is the only thing that can mend a broken heart. No amount of entertainment or laughs or anything from culture can heal a broken heart. They can make you forget about your troubles, but they can't heal your wounds. Only the love of Christ can do it. And so I want to encourage you, as you engage with friends, families, coworkers, when you ask them how they're doing, and they say, oh, I'm fine, you know, you know that response, right? You know what fine means? Freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. It's fine. <laughs> Husbands, if your wife says you're fine, don't use that on your spouse, please. <laughs> or at least don't put it on me. You can say you had it. But if someone says, yeah, I'm doing fine, actually press in. We're so resistant to do this because we know it will take a time investment. And because we're such in a busy culture, we don't think we have time. But what else are we here for if not to love the people around us with the love of Christ? And so when you ask someone how they're doing and they say they're fine, now you know what that means. Ask a second question. How are you really doing? Can I help you in some way? Would you come to church with me? That's what it means to go over the top. This is why when the religious leaders of Jesus' day asked him what is the most important commandment, he said this, Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandments are those. So number one, love and empathy. Number two, knowledge and discernment. Our weapons are knowledge and discernment. You have the written word of God at your disposal. We must learn it. We must know what it says. Because there are so many false interpretations out there trying to tell you what it means. But you can read for yourself. I promise you can read the Word of God plainly. Use the app, use a physical Bible, but the Word of God will come alive to you and He will speak to you through it. Because this is what we're called to do. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How can you test the spirits unless you have a litmus test to do it with? And the litmus test is the word of God. You go back to the word. Even if you hear some wild interpretation, some wild doctrine on social media or wherever, you go back to the word. You ask God, speak to me through this, and he will speak to you, I promise. 
This is the crux of Christian apologetics, learning how to defend your faith. It doesn't mean to apologize. It means to give a defense. This is also why, get ready for a plug, you should join the Crossing Bible College. <laughs> you can go to crossingbiblecollege.com and you can sign up for a class starting this week. And it's so important because the only way you can stand your ground and stand firm, like it says in Ephesians, is to know what you are standing on. This is why you need to get in a life group where you wrestle with the word and learn what the Bible says. 1 Peter 3.15 says it like this. Honor the Lord, the Messiah in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Watch the second part. However, do this with gentleness and respect. Always be ready to give a defense in gentleness and respect. You can do both. You can stand firm on the doctrines of the Bible, stand firm in your faith in gentleness and respect. And I also want to encourage you. Maybe you haven't heard them before, but there are so many good resources, good arguments for Christianity to be true. So many. I could tell you about the beginning of the universe and the Kalam cosmological argument and why the universe points to God. I could tell you about the teleological argument and why the fine-tuning of the universe points to God. We can talk about objective morality and how there's no basis apart from God. I could talk to you about Leibniz and the argument of contingency. I could do all of that, and I want you to know there are good reasons to know that God is true. They are out there if you search for it. But Dr. William Lane Craig says this. While good arguments and apologetics, we can show Christianity to be true, the only way to know it to be true is the Holy Spirit. We can show it to be true in many ways. I encourage you to find them. But the way we know it to be true is the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended into heaven, right before he went up, he told his disciples this in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Power is needed to go over the top and spread the message of Jesus Christ. And that power comes from the Holy Spirit. And the power is our ultimate weapon, the power of the Holy Spirit. Any false idea and doctrine that comes against the name of Jesus will be put to death with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can give you words when you need them, strength when yours is failing, and hope in the darkest places. As I looked up trench warfare, I found the turning point fascinating. In 1918, the Allies began to use these tanks. I know they look kind of funny, but, you know. They used these tanks, and imagine crossing, just going over the top yourself and going over the top in, in no man's land in a tank like that. The war began to turn because those tanks were impervious to the enemy machine gun fire. That's what it looks like if you can move with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be in fear of speaking the truth, spreading the gospel. You don't have to be in fear of what others will say or what others will do. When you move in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's like you're traveling in that. It's a tank for spreading the gospel. So what are we fighting against? Bad ideas and doctrines. What are our weapons? Love, wisdom, and the Holy Spirit. And this third question is for you directly. Have you gone over the top? Have you recently ever gone over the top and spoken to someone about Jesus Christ? The time is now. There's no other time after this. It's now to begin standing for the word of God and for Jesus Christ. I found it interesting. One of the biggest challenges in trench warfare was actually not the dangers sometimes, but boredom. And I thought this was so interesting. Watch this clip from the History Channel. I think one word that would surprise people about life in a trench, boredom. A lot of time is spent just sitting, cleaning tools, and being scared to death the battle's gonna start any minute. It was just the day-to-day -day monotony of being trapped in this very small space and fighting for a, a war that's really um, fought in inches. I thought it was so fascinating that one of the biggest issues was boredom. I feel like that's such a picture of today where so many Christians are too afraid to go over the top, they just sit in the trench bored and boredom turns to apathy and they never actually move in the power of God to spread the gospel. 
There's an apathy that has come from modern Christianity. Maybe it's from a fear, maybe it's from a self-preservation, a self-protection. But we see culture moving away. We see culture moving away from Christianity and Jesus Christ. You see deconstruction trending all the time or ex-evangelicals as you see on social media. We see it moving inch by inch. And the biggest problem we're dealing with is boredom. And if you don't operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and actually do the great commission of actually spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will suffer from apathy and boredom hiding in the trenches. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, I believe is applicable for today. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciousness are seared. Some will depart from the faith, and we are seeing that even today. Another effect of staying in the trenches for extended periods of time during World War I was something called getting shell-shocked. That's not a Ninja Turtles reference. Getting shell-shocked meant you sat there for so long hearing the machine gun fire, hearing the artillery explode around you that you developed a PTSD and you were too afraid to even move at that point. So many of us as Christians have sat hearing what culture is saying about Jesus, hearing what culture is saying about the word of God, and we've become shell-shocked. That we're so paralyzed now, we can't even move with Holy Spirit and do what he says. Listen, it's not gonna be easy. You will experience people who ridicule you, who make fun of you. Maybe some of you experience that in the workplace even now. But Jesus said this in John 16, 33. I've said this to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame already. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can overcome the obstacles, not the people. You can overcome the obstacles to reach the people for Jesus Christ. I want to remind you once again of the Apostle Paul as he spoke to the Athenian community. I love this artwork of him teaching the Athenian community about Jesus with literal idols in the background. What a picture of what it's like to spread the gospel in the American culture today. There are idols and false gods everywhere. But look at Paul, one man, no physical weapons in his hands, but working with the power of the Holy Spirit, telling people about Jesus Christ. You can be that one woman, that one man, who stands for Jesus and makes a difference in your circle of influence, in your mountain of influence. Maybe it's education, maybe it's business, maybe it's with a family or a friend. You can be the person that brings them the gospel. I wanna read one final story from World War I. This is the story of Horace Augustus Curtis. That's an awesome name, you got a good name. But Horace Augustus Curtis, he was supposed to be a nobody. His father died when he was just four years old. His mother was poor. But he joined the military, and in World War I, he fought many battles bravely, going up the ranks all the way up to sergeant. And then one day, he had the most incredible act of heroism. January 6th, 1919, this article was printed in the London Gazette 103 years ago. But listen to this account of Horace Augustus Curtis. For most conspicuous bravery and devotion to duty east of La Chateau on the morning of 18th October, 1918, when in the attack, his platoon came unexpectedly under intense machine gun fire. Realizing that their attack would fail unless the enemy guns were silenced, Sergeant Curtis, without hesitation, rushed forward through our own barrage of friendly fire and the enemy fire. He went over the top and eliminated two teams of enemy gunmen single-handedly, whereupon the remaining four guns surrendered. But it gets even better. Turning his attention to a train load of reinforcements, he succeeded in capturing over 100 enemies before his comrades could even join him. His valor and disregard of danger inspired all. 
That's like biblical level courage and bravery. A literal miracle. If Horace can do that, you can do that in your workplace. You could stand firm, even in the face of tremendous adversity, trusting in the Holy Spirit to guide you. He will give you the words. He will give you the power to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment, I want to ask this question. If you have someone in your sphere of influence that you know you need to tell them about Jesus, or you just need to show them the love of Christ, or maybe you just need to ask them how they're really doing. If there's a person that you're thinking of that God has brought to your mind, would you raise your hand and hold it up? You're saying, I know, there is someone in my circle of influence. Can you raise your hand right now? I'm not gonna make you do anything or say anything. I just wanna pray over you. You're saying, I have someone in my area, my circle of influence, hands everywhere, that I need to tell them about Jesus. There's hands still going up, so I'm gonna give it a second. Ask God, is there someone in my life that I'm supposed to reach for the gospel? Let's pray over you right now. Jesus, you see these hands that are raised and the people represented by these hands. God, we pray that you begin to open the mind, open the hearts of the people represented to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And most of all, that you would empower these men and women with their hands raised, empower them with the Holy Spirit, give them the right words to say, the right questions to ask, give them the biblical knowledge and understanding that they can recall so they can spread the gospel of Jesus effectively. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. And if you would keep your heads bowed and eye closed just for a moment, I want to speak to another group. Maybe you're saying, you know, I'm actually not a Christian yet, but I know in my heart I need to give my life to this Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for you 2,000 years ago. It was a payment for sin so you could be forgiven for all eternity and be with him. And so if you're saying, I want to give my life to Christ right now, we're going to pray a simple prayer all together. Everyone's going to say it so you're not alone. But if that's you, I want you to pray from the bottom of your heart. Everyone say, dear Jesus, forgive me. I give you my life. I want to follow you for the rest of my days. Help me to do it in Jesus' name. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer, we want to just give you a card. We're not going to make you say anything or do anything, but if at the count of three, you would raise your hand and keep it up for just a moment. You prayed that prayer for the first time, giving your life to Christ. If you would, one, two, three, raise your hand. If that was you saying, I gave my life to Christ just now. No one's looking around. This is between you and God. You're saying, I gave my life to Christ right now. I'm doing it right now. I'm done running. I'm done resisting. No one's looking around. There's hands going up. We're trying to get to you. We just want to give you a card. Is there anyone else you're saying, I still want to raise my hand. I still want to say I give my life to Christ. There's still time. You can raise your hand even now. Amen. Praise God. Church, would you look up here and celebrate like crazy for all the hands that went up. Praise God. Praise God. So good. Now, if you would stand with me for a moment. Our worship team is going to sing one more chorus. And as they sing, I want to encourage you, if you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you wanted to, we have prayer partners down here at the altar. They want to connect with you, help you on your next steps in your journey with Jesus. Or if you need prayer for anything, you can come down as we sing, and they would love to pray with you.